morning. Welcome to Lex Radio. This is the Breakfast with Milo. And in the studio with us, we have a female, Eloise Yogbaudu, legal practitioner, lecturer, and many more. If you inju- introduce yourself. <laughs> Good afternoon, Kunle. Um, like I said, my name is Ifemena. Yeah, good good morning, rather. <laughs> uh, good morning. My name is Ifemena Eloise Abroad, and like Kuni has said, I'm a legal practitioner. I used to be a law teacher. I am involved in law reform. I do a lot of things, but I mean, um, Ifemena is my name. I like to say it's my name on weekdays. On weekends, my name is Illumide. <laughs> the inside joke is Illumide of Lagos, but Ifemena is my name, so thank you, Kunli. All right. Um, thank you, Ife. Uh, we would like you to give us an insight into your law story. I think I already explained mm-hmm. what that means. Quite p- very brief, as brief as possible. Okay, know. so as briefly as possible, I'll just say that I did not want to be a lawyer. I mean, I studied law in the university. Up until my 400 level, I did not want to study law wow. <laughs> at all. I wanted to be a musician, and I have two singles on the internet. Don't Google them. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. <laughs> and if you do, please cut me some slack. Uh, but then I found love for law when I had my first real practical experience in a small law office in Ikeja, then at a bigger office in Ikui, you know, and just seeing that I could get it done made me go back to the classroom, take courses that, you know, I sort of liked, and then I st- grades got better, interest got better, started practicing, People say I'm good at what I do, you know. <laughs> so that's <laughs> it for me. That's the story. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, so you you were called to bar, and then the next year you were made an adjunct lecturer at the law school. Can you give us an like how did that happen? Uh, I'd like to know. Okay, so just to 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 rearrange the order. Okay. I was made a lecture. I was offered the job if I got called to bar. Okay. So I was in law school. Uh, there was some. I don't. Want don't want to give too many details, but there were some tests, some mock tests called snap testing. Um, I was the highest in the course, which was corporate law practice. But then beyond being highest, there was some stuff in the questions that I did identify was wrong and gave an answer to. It gave some clarity in my script. And I was invited to come over to the DDG's office. We had a discussion about corporate law. Incidentally, I'd written my project on corporate law and was supervised by somebody who is my role model and mentor, Dr. Olawo Nyesen. And we had that discussion, and she just said, you know what? You know what you're talking about. And would you like to lecture? I said, oh, well, I was overwhelmed. I didn't see it coming, you know, but I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. Why not? And got called to bad December 2017, stepped into the class for the first time, I think January 2018. I said, it was, it was fun. Yeah. So that's how that happened anyway. <laughs> that's good to know. Um, so while you were... Um While you were um, practicing, you were also teaching. How were you able to juggle it too? Knowing the, the demands uh, of <laughs> practicing in Nigeria. Well, um, it was not an easy time, if I'm being honest, mm-hmm. um, because my work at the law firm was also very demanding. I work as track and partners, by the way, and I would see myself having to give, put in extra hours just to be able to compensate for my time out of work on Thursdays because when I had to teach at law school. So I literally work from 8.30 a.m. till 11, sometimes till midnight. Um, on Wednesdays before Thursdays classes, I would not have any sleep. You know, I would basically be up till 4 a.m., sleep from 4 till 6, wake up, go into the classroom and teach. And then when I get home on Wednesday evening, I just sleep till Thursday mo- till Friday. On Thursday evening, I just sleep till Friday morning. Um, it was very demanding, but it was also very exciting because I did find joy in teaching that class. Mm-hmm. I also found a lot of joy in doing my work, so it was fantastic for me. Plus, the rewards came. Um, I mean, I got retained at the firm because I was still doing my NYC at the time. And I mean, the law school class ended up being the most successful to dates and had the best pass rate in corporate law practice. So I'd say it was a justified experience for me. <laughs> <laughs> so it was uh, worth it. A round of I do. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Um, thanks. So yeah, seeing as you had a little background in lecturing, and yeah. you also in the previous year you had been a student, um, the question is, what was, what is, what is your view, or what are your views on the educational system, like using the law school as a yardstick or focusing on the law school? And possibly universities in relation to teaching law in schools. Mm. What is your view on the system that operates 
also including the examination and what her person now what do you think would be more appropriate make, yeah more appropriate to be the um framework that should exist like mm. what are your opinions on that so um i'm very passionate about legal education alongside i mean exemplary law practice and law reform but for legal education specifically i'd say i was lucky to experience it as a student first and as a lecturer immediately after so it puts me in a position to actually appreciate the issue um i think that for me what i see is that first of as a student i'd say that what i recognized was that um how do i let me just say in a nutshell that i think the legal education system has to be dismantled and put together again that's where i'll start from really? you know i think that yeah really i think that the law school for instance can do a lot better i'm not even sure if it's to, if it should exist as a separate institution that's the starting point or if it should be an examining body the way we have with the new york bar but then i would just say the issue of procedural law which is raised at law school um which is what law school says it does, you know, and I'm saying this being a part of law school myself, even till now, because I'm still affiliated with them. But the point is, uh, we sort of miss out the substance in teaching at law school and even at universities. I think the Nigerian education system just encourages you to, you know, read to pass for grades. Yeah. It doesn't really impact the knowledge that you need, you know, to carry on your practice as a legal practitioner. And the goal of legal education is to prepare lawyers for practice. That is the objective. The question now is, how well has legal education in Nigeria prepared a regular lawyer for practice? I would speak for myself. You know, I knew everything in the law school curriculum when I started my practice, but who I am now, uh, the law school curriculum and the university curriculum contributes perhaps maybe just one percent to it because everything I've learned has come in practice, and it's not even in learning the tricks. It's just in understanding why we do what we do. So the law schools and the universities have to understand what they do and why they do what they do. You know, just to go back on an experience I had this year. I was privileged to speak at the University of Lagos Lecturers Faculty of Law um, retreat mm -hmm. as to the quality of standards of education delivery, something of that sort. And I did recommend, I did a written paper to the Dean Professor Senwan. I did recommend that, you know, there has to be a synergy where we have practical sessions where they tell students the idea, the practical value of what you're learning. For instance, I suggested that in contract law class, for instance, you could teach students about common clauses in contracts. You could teach students about, you know, indemnities, you know, um, assignments and transfer, just things that will pop up in regular contract law. So I think in a nutshell that the legal education system at present is not fit for purpose, the purpose being to train lawyers for practice. I think that to make that happen, a revamp has to happen. You have to go into, you have to harmonize practice and the academics to ensure that people who leave um, law schools or leave the universities are able to look at the situation and apply their legal knowledge to solve the problem on ground. The only thing they should be lacking is experience. Apart from that, you know, having not done it before, they should be able to comfort on the first go. So that, in a nutshell, is my is my view. It's a very big nutshell. No, no, no. That's, that's, <laughs> that's an interesting thing is I was going to ask you in terms of um, the way we learn in the country. Mm -hmm. um, Mostly, um, fetch, pour back, mm -hmm. retain little. That's yeah, that's basically what it is. Basically, what we do. And I should also say, as to the grading system, because that's something that really comes up every time, is that I just think that to examine a lawyer, you need to look at what a lawyer needs before you examine a lawyer. What does a lawyer need to be a successful lawyer? If you if you're practicing in litigation or dispute resolution, you need advocacy skills. No law school in the country grades you based on advocacy skills. Why? To be a solicitor, you need to have, you need to be composed, you need to have, be a clear thinker, you need to be a good drafter. Perhaps they'll say the law school curriculum currently trains you to do that. But is one year enough of that training and assessment? Does it really reflect your capacity to, you know, negotiate circumstances and carry out transactions? It does not. How can a commercial lawyer leave the law school and not know what due diligence is? That's one question to ask yourself. Why should a lawyer leave the law school as a litigator or a disrespect and not know the function of a pleading or not know how to argue a case? So if you're going to grade students, don't grade them, you know, the weakest grade here, the strongest grade here or not. Just grade them on what shows the actual capacity to, you know, practice the law. So, yeah. I was, I was going to um, talk about the grading mm -hmm. because um, one thing I know is like when you leave the law school, yeah, areas of law you might never double in till you, till you die. Correct. And it has no effect on your success. Correct. So 
some people thrive excellently in litigation. They never get involved in corporate law. They never know anything about tax. And they are good. Now, coming off the fact that that is how the space is, mm-hmm. why are we, why are the students graded in a manner that says you must be an expert in everything when mm. this is a profession where you can specialize? Mm. Now, in response, that's what, that was like the initial, t- and in response to what you said about um, advocacy skills and all that, I'm assuming somebody will respond to you and say that their lawyers will never have to use their advo- advocacy skills. Mm. They thrive. They mm. don't need that. Right, and I also think there's this portfolio stuff we do in law school where mm-hmm. we have our um, logbook and mm-hmm. stuff. Like, they, they, it's there. We're meant to use it, but I mean, a lot of times people don't even <laughs> fill the logbook <laughs> truthfully. People correct f- just do what mm-hmm. they want, and it's not it's not as much as it people is because of the way the process is carried out. When you go for your portfolio, when you, you are sitting in front of the lecturers, that process is not as focused on as po- like some people just go in and they just. Flip, flip, flip. They're not looking at anything. Uh, okay, go next person. Right. My, that m- now that might be because we probably have too many people in school, uh-huh. in too many students in the law school, and few teachers to actually take time and do the portfolio assessment. Assessment right would really be uh, an extreme stress on those teachers. Uh-huh. Probably that. Um, and yeah, looking at all that, like, w- w- what w- what would you say? Okay, so I'm just going to respond. You raised two issues, yeah. you know, the specialization point, which also dabbles into the advocacy point I made. You know, what I think is a fix to both issues is that, you know, and this is just me thinking off my head, I think that the idea that law school tends to um, present itself as a degree is wrong. So, mm. you know, I have nothing against people who get first class degrees at law school or who do it at law school, which is fantastic, but. It is a professional practice degree. So it should say you are qualified to become a lawyer or you're not qualified to become a lawyer, then show your strengths. So when I say advocacy skills and due diligence and transaction skills, if I pass the bar exams, for instance, it pass, then the law firm who's hiring me should have the benefit of doubt to see that, should have the benefit of seeing that. This person you, that has put a CV before you, his strength is in advocacy. Mm. Her strength it's in transactions. It mm. should reflect that. And when it reflects that, you don't have the first class 2-1 thing hanging over your head. Yeah. They will then ask you, what role do you want to apply for? If your strength and advocacy, why are you coming to transactions? Mm-hmm. And if your strength and advocacy are showing on your law school degree, then they know that this particular person is a good advocate or would make a good advocate at least. We can assume that, you know. Yeah. So I think that, you know, not giving a blanket grading yeah. but giving a grading that is that says you pass the bar these are the strengths these are the weaknesses helps and it and the breakdown does do this because for my breakdown i had it being criminal litigation i have never stepped into a criminal court in my life i had yeah. all A's in other courses and maybe it does show to some extent my strength because i work now in a commercial firm that doesn't do any criminal cases yeah. so maybe that shows my strengths but then if we take it with the first class toga the rest of the, of the breakdown will perhaps presents you know a clearer picture of what person's strengths are. And if you make it clearer as to advocacy, you know, transactions, you know, things that are more relatable to practice, that would help. Then to the second point you made, um, the portfolio assessment, you know, what I think is that, and as you were speaking, it just came to mind that portfolio assessment is actually the most effective method in the Nigerian law school system for determining how competent a student is. You know, yeah. it's just that, and I and I wonder why. Whenever a process is seemingly subjective, we tend to not take it as seriously in Nigeria. I don't know if it's the culture. Nobody wants to fail anybody. Nobody wants to be the one that's caused somebody's downfall. If they put max the portfolio assessment and say you must get a minimum sixty percent before you can sit for the bar exams, that would work because anybody who comes with the portfolio assessment committee would understand what went on in his courts and in his chambers. Yes. Now, based on the understanding they display, you would then know if they are competent to sit for the bar exams or not. Because why should a law student who wants to be called a lawyer go to a chamber and a court and not understand what's going on? That's hilarious. That's that's uh, it's it's upsetting. Yeah. So we send you. You're supposed to be fit and proper. We send you to a court and to a chamber. You come back. I don't know what went on. That means you're not ready to be called to bar. That's what I think. You know. So I think if we take that period that process more seriously, students will take it more seriously. And would have better graduates from the law school. So I think that the process has yeah. more 
holds yeah. more score than yeah. the actual rating. Yeah, test. it does. Maybe maybe not, not maybe not even holds more score. It just serves as a filter to say if you don't get sixty percent in mm. portfolio assessment, you can progress to writing the bar exams. Mm. That's my take. That makes sense. If you were telling us how um, you, you never really wanted to practice, and correct, up, up until <laughs> like your fourth year. Correct. had an interest in practice and then later you found the passion and then you found the space and all that. Um, can you tell us how practice is now for you? Beyond being an adjunct lecturer, how is practice like? How, how, what, what do you have to say about how the journey has been? Um, I'll say it's been, it's, been, it's been an interesting one for me and it has come in many dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, so far I've been very fortunate, I say fortunate because I believe that all these things are opportunities that I've taken very fortunate to be involved in you know not just law practice but like law teaching as you've mentioned and law yeah. reform as well mm -hmm. um for practice we've spoken to law teaching already but for practice practice has been fantastic for me you know i've been able to do a couple things that i didn't think i would do as of now you know <laughs> um I, positive things positive things of course <laughs> <laughs> i was recently shortlisted you know finalist in the africa legal awards most promising newcomer private oh. practice category wow um so that that for me was you know it's good to be recognized it's an african award being top 10 <laughs> being top 10 in africa those. was congratulations thank you it was very big for me and it's still my pin tweet till today um mm. apart <laughs> from that you know what i see myself as and what i see when I look at my practices that I see myself, you know, trying to be the example for younger lawyers and I mean teenagers who want to become lawyers in future. You know how you're young, you see Davido, you see Whiskey, that's what the youth see now. Yeah. I want you to look up mm. and say, you know, there's somebody who's a lawyer who's doing big things who I want to be like. Who's that's young. Who's young, exactly. That's exactly what I want to portray, what I intend to portray, what I do. That's why I do things I do, you know. And for me, I, I do this because I don't see many examples of lawyers these days. Um, even the ones who are, you know, outstanding are not are not publicly recognized. Um, I mean, very few Nigerians know the best legal practitioners in the country. They probably just know Femi Falano, who's brilliant, you know, but we need to have more examples. Even beyond this, not many lawyers are, are examples to, to be why, followed. Why did you say? Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I well, the reason for that. yeah, you know, so, I mean, one of the views, one of the things I take strong views on, I mean, I have many strong views, is the rank of senior advocate of Nigeria. Okay. You know, when you hear senior advocate of Nigeria, you have in mind, you know, a legal practitioner who is distinguished in competence and in character. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> I have been in courts where I've seen senior advocates, you know, argue ridiculous points of law and facts. That is mm. not. You may be a senior advocate in rank, but in competence, I beg <laughs> to differ. <laughs> On character, I know several senior advocates of Nigeria who are standing trial for criminal offences. Mm. Should not be too. And I, I don't know if I'd mentioned before in one of our casual conversations how yeah. you know in England there was an issue with Lord Denning being standing trial for something, and he said to himself, you know, I can't be the master of rules and stand trial. God forbid, you know. And he, st he stepped down. Um, that's not the way it happens in Nigeria. People do not, out of honor or respect the profession or deference, treat the profession as it should be treated. You cannot, um, for instance, be an advocate or be a judge or, you know, and be indicted <laughs> on some level. It doesn't inspire confidence. It does not. Mm -hmm. And as a profession that renders service to the public, how the public views us is very important. Back in the days, being a lawyer was a big deal now. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Well, I, I think people <laughs> still care. But well, probably maybe the prestige around the profession. Well, I would just say that not as it was. Um, some some guy on on Twitter, you know, had a debate with me over the camera 2020, and he thought he had a view and was tagging me to Falano's tweet, telling me, "See what Falano said." Uh, is agreeing with me who are you to disagree with me you know of course i'm not going to tell him i was a lecturer in nigerian law school corporate law practice or that i've studied karma mm -hmm. back to back but you know if when a non-lawyer starts to debate the law with a lawyer uh, then he tells you what they think about profession well and this is like mm -hmm. the situation where some you feel something is wrong with you and then you go to webmd and you say something and then you argue with your doctor <laughs> 
<laughs> well, if you're about to die, reflection of if you're about to die, <laughs> and especially the doctor tells you you're about to die, you will not argue with him doing him. If you think it's that serious, then you wouldn't argue with him doing him. And, and by the way, even besides the point, the public tends to listen more to public and listen, listen to lawyers now. They think all lawyers are liars. They think all senior kids are thieves. The other day, um, a governor, I mean, two governors of in this country have gifted publicly cars and houses to judges. And the public is saying, what about our roads? Hmm. It's for everybody to chop, the judiciary as well. This is the public perception of our profession. Okay. Um, coming off what you said about the silks, um, yeah. my question is, to get to that stage, there are certain criteria you mm-hmm. must fulfill. Correct. Are you saying these criteria aren't sufficient enough hmm. for what that title should stand for? Hmm. There should be more to... Oh, you must have a case. Or finish the case of Supreme Court. That, that's more than that. Yeah. There's something that was good to character. And I'm saying this because it's something I strongly believe. Okay. That's part of the problem of, of governance, maybe worldwide, mm-hmm. Nigeria. But using Nigeria as an example, you see, um, people should be held to certain standards when they occupy certain positions. Correct. Right. Um, if you want to, be, if you're going to study to be a pilot. I think if you're the type who is clumsy and aloof and lacks, you the type to lack focus, mm-hmm. that shouldn't be the cause the for part you. For you. Understand? Now, if we have people, it's and one, the area I feel most about this is the legislature. Mm-hmm. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. These people who are, who are supposed to make our laws. <laughs> In fact, I wouldn't mind if they have to go for a one year course the way people go to law school because mm-hmm. that's it's such a very important part of the progression of the country crucial so you must <coughs> have certain trainings we can't have the people write our laws jumping over do you understand mm-hmm. there has to be some certain level of understanding it, 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 it's if so yeah coming off that idea i can understand what you're talking about um about the sales and stuff but i i also understand that i and i know yeah criteria, criteria for, that. for that so are you saying the criteria aren't enough mm. what would you rather have because, I mean, not every criteria can really filter our characters. Correct. Yeah. So okay, so in, I'm going to try and address, because in, in answer to the question, I'm going to address two points, you know. Yeah. The first is Rank of Silk. Interestingly, mm. a new shortlist was published um, very recently. I think it was a couple of days ago, I think. Yeah. I'm um, just listing, you know, people who um, have been shortlisted to be seen advocates, considered for the Rank of Silk. And, you know, I just thought to myself, I see these names, I don't know these people. I'm a regular young lawyer who's yeah. going to be looking up to these people once they attain the rank of silk. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that the rank of silk is a rank of leadership. Yeah. The rank does not confer it, the rank recognizes it. So in essence, the rank says, I see you as a leader of the bar in yeah. competence and character, and I will make you silk. So in terms of the criteria on ground, I think the criteria is very, quali- it's very quantitative, mm. not qualitative. Mm. To say somebody's a leader of the bar, the person has to show exemplary conduct yeah. and exemplary competence. Mm. Ask them, of the 14 or 15 or so cases you've done, in which of those cases can you show us that you conducted yourself or that you showed exemplary competence? In your immediate and surrounding environment, can the people there say you are a person of exemplary ca- character? Yeah. Those are the two questions to ask yourselves. The body of benches, you know, will probably, um, or the, sorry, the LPPC will probably, you know, judge you based on your competence, based on the cases you bring before them. I probably decide. I don't know how they decide, yeah. but I don't know many people who have contributed to law in the past. Okay, so you would also how many be years? saying impact of yeah. what you did. Yeah. So I would ask you: What's you presented this case to us. At, you won this case at the Supreme Court. What has this case done for us in Nigeria and our law and our jurisprudence? How did you assist the judge? In reaching this conclusion, you know, I saw a case in England where they argued, ah, I can't remember this case, but there was an argument as regards damages across two contracts, mm-hmm. whether damages on one contract could be inferred from another contract. You know, it was a very substantive argument. If I remember the case, I'll forward it to you guys, you yeah, know, no those are substantive arguments. Whoever wins or loses that case contributes to the jurisprudence. Yeah. In Nigeria, at the Supreme Court level, you still have arguments and authorities on stamp and seal whether or not to sign a writ of summons if you present that case to me and i'm sitting on the lppc i would chase you out with your silk because the fact that you're bringing that case to me for one 
shows that you don't know what you are doing. Two, it shows that you have nothing else to offer. Mm. People have argued great cases. There are cases that change law for good, you know. Even people that argue jurisdiction, look at Madukolu. Whoever argued Madukolu till dates has laid a mark. You know, so in terms of the criteria, just to keep it short and simple, there has to be a merit-based process. We have to be sure that they are both leaders in character and competence. I'd recommend, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, when they publish the shortlist, perhaps they should go back to their branches. The branches should, you know, make some comments about them, not by the chairman, but by the general branch, maybe general vote. If you don't get 7% of your branch, you go away, you know. And they should make sure that they do a pitch, proper pitch. In my portfolio, I have this 12, 15 cases. These are how these cases affect, you know, law and, you know, and our practice, you know, let it be public. Let people decide. Let people choose their leaders. If somebody I never knew from from Adam comes before me and tells me I have changed the law in one, two, three, four, five ways, I'll be impressed. And I'll vote him to be silk. That's how I see it, you know. So I think the criteria has to be more merit based, more qualitative mm. than quantitative. Now any Tom Dick and Harry can have sixteen cases and apply for silk. Yeah. It should not be in that way. Then on the and, and the point I want to make, which also clarifies something I said before. You know, the problem with the legislature, this is by the way. It's not that common men cannot make laws. It's that they don't understand, they don't seem to understand their function and their importance to us. Yeah. And, and just to dribble back on what I said before, it's not like a non-lawyer cannot provide perspective on a law. Sure. It's just that if you are debating the effects of a law or the validity of a law, then the question of validity is best resolved by somebody who knows how laws work. But then it doesn't mean that you can't take, you know, an opposing view from a non-lawyer. It just means that when it comes to some particular questions of law, yeah. a lawyer is in the best position to answer it. And that's Definitely. why I said if a non-lawyer thinks that on a question of law, a strict question of law, they know more than you, then it means that you're not confident in what your system is producing. Mm. So, yeah. Well, I've heard what you said. And, um, do you not un do you not think um with the so there, there, there are two areas i'm going to address okay. one is the type of cases that you you speak about i'm um, getting to the supreme court and i think mm -hmm. i've heard something recently that um that's not just about the silks it's mm -hmm. about our system generally mm -hmm. cases like that should not be going that far mm -hmm. they should probably be ending at the high court correct right so that that's, that's, that's one correct two if we tend to make everything political in the country. Mm -hmm. And I even think, possibly, I, I, I don't like speaking too much on issues I'm not quite grounded mm -hmm. in, but possibly I would assume even the process for becoming a son and aspiring to the silk, you know, definitely there will be politics in play. Mm. I also think, now that we've spoken about it, and I, like basically people who want to reach that place, mostly just aspire to fulfill the criteria exactly right not embody what <laughs> the criteria exactly is trying to get exactly of type of mental of people that should get to exactly get. but i also think like if you if it became the type of thing where you're like oh your brand should vote mm -hmm. just make it don't you think that makes it more political, political correct you know right yeah there's there's that fear for real you know because people are going to be um going to lobby Exactly. People are going to vote because, you know, want our guy to become silk, you know, mm -hmm. but I do feel that, and this is why I talked about the leadership matrix, a silk is the leader of a bar. If the bar chooses a Mr. Tom, a Mr. Dick, a Mr. Harry to be its leader of the bar by any process, then the bar has chosen that leader. Why I speak for the involvement of the branches, maybe not just one branch, maybe they do six branches across the country and out of six, four, seven percent of four must speak you. But the point is, why I speak to that effect is that let the branches with their hands recognize their silks. Mm -hmm. In the last MBA election, we did note that it was a war between non-silks and silks because the lawyers currently do not recognize the advocates of Nigeria as their leaders. If they did by some measure, then probably will not be where we are. But this is of this is just by the way. Yeah. Um, I completely agree with your point that people now just strive to fill the requirements, yeah. the quantitative requirements. Yeah. Um, I'd also say that it's ridiculous because now the rank of silk is essentially just a billing um, element. So I'm a regular lawyer, I charge you 50 million. I'm now silk, I charge you 100 million. Hmm. That's why many people do it. Yeah. Why do you want to be silk when you're not silk material? You should shy away from me because my... my 
I mean, you have the answer, right? <laughs> so I can build double. Yeah, so you know, <laughs> my I work for um, you know somebody I consider exemplary, and he he does say to me that he considers the rank of silk a burden, you know, and that is how people should see it. Um, you made my, you made a point, which I can't really recall. I'm not sure I can recall it. Um, okay, just no. Yes, you made a point just before, but I can't recall it. But you can go on. Um, oh, that they do it so they could double the. No, not that. You know, when you when you spoke the first time. But yeah, go on. Um, okay, uh, so you work on the justice reform project or you are involved in the justice reform yeah project. can you just give us like a brief <laughs> insight to, into what that is all about yeah it's a big part of what i do and yeah. um you see uh, yes i remember what you said okay it ties okay. into this <laughs> <laughs> so the just Reform project is a not-for-profit organization it was set up by 20 advocates of nigeria mm-hmm. 20 of whom i respect okay. and regard so, so we have 20 still respectable <laughs> we have 20 yes then out of those 20 no. more senior advocates of nigeria joined them Okay. I respect those people as well, okay. you know, so I endorse them. <laughs> and then, after the Senate of Nigeria, someone I'd, somewhere is going I'd, to watch this and be like, "Who are you to well, endorse anybody?" Well, if you, if somebody asks you if you can tie a shoelace, you tell them yes, I can tie my shoelace. If somebody asks me if I can endorse them, I tell them yes, I can endorse them because of who I am. If you want to know who I am, you should Google me. But that's by the <laughs> way. Um, Go on. So the point is basically from twenty silks to more silks. We got lawyers. We got businessmen. We got people in society it's mm-hmm. now a body of nigerians yeah. who want a better justice system yeah and um, what they're basically doing is carrying out projects putting in place policies to make sure that things function in justice and it's a very huge task it's very big because yeah. it's a very broad view but so far so good baby steps but effective steps as well and i'll give an example based on what you said this is what i was trying to remember you did mention that you don't think that those kind of cases should get to the Supreme Court talked about writ of someone's uh, sign stamp and seal, correct? Yeah. So, recently, the Senate Committee on Judiciary published a call for memorandum, you know, saying um, if you want to um, want to amend the Constitution, submit so your proposals. And one of the proposals we made as just from projects, which is one of the things we've done, yeah. is to amend the right of appeal, which mm-hmm. is something I was personally involved in. And the idea is, one of the simple things we try to do is to say, on matters of procedure, questions of procedure, questions arising out of the civil procedure rules, the high courts of whatever state, the trial court should be the final courts. Mm. So on issues like signing rates of summons would end at the trial courts. Yeah. Issues like service of processes would end at the trial courts. The only time we can go beyond the trial courts, because we must recognize that there are instances where it could cause a problem, yeah. is when you allege that it can occasion a miscarriage of justice, in which case you should then seek leave of, leave of the court of appeal to have your appeal heard. But in that case, because you're seeking leave, you can no longer delay cases. Because what usually happens is that once you appeal, you file a motion for stay of proceedings, and you stay the proceedings until you decide whether or not you can use stamp and stay Lord with the Supreme Court and come back. Mm-hmm. That's plus eight years. I imagine. So we've done that. Another project we've done, which I think, if I do say so myself, is commendable, mm-hmm. is the was the advocacy we put into the adoption of remote hearing. So quick okay. narration. When COVID pandemic broke out, we wrote to um, <laughs> we wrote to the NBA president saying, "Say there's a pandemic, courts cannot close. There's adopt remote hearings." We wrote to the CJM saying, "There's a pandemic, courts cannot close. Adopt remote hearings." A couple of days, maybe a week after, the president, you know, released a communique saying, um, "I'm adopting remote hearings. I'm adopting. I'm giving palliatives, which was something we also suggested as well." Yeah. And it was good to see that happen. You know, then fast forward months after, the NGC says. Remote hearings is what that's what we'll do. Courts across Nigeria are passing practices for remote hearings, and mm-hmm. everybody's saying remote hearings. Um, you know, and we're happy to see this happen based on our prompt. You know, and also we noticed that there was a problem with implementation, and we said, okay, we're going to show people that it's doable. You know, and then we conducted the first full virtual hearing in collaboration with Lagos and Judiciary. It's all on YouTube. Just said, just first from projects. First full mock remote hearing was presided over by Honorable Justice Lushola Williams, retired, and okay. Honorable Justice Pai, currently at the High Court of Lagos State. Okay. Had real life lawyers, it was a real life case, and I was registrar of that procedure, and it was very good. You know, I think the final thing I'll say we have done is that, and this is a very big one because um, it's very important, but it's important that it was done as well. Sometime in May, the NJC announced a list of maybe 50 people who were to be nominated for appointment to the High Court of the FCT. 
and there was an outrage by the public saying people should not be appointed. They knew somebody, knew somebody, they're not yeah. qualified, you know. And yeah. then Jerry said, okay, we know what we'll look through, we'll examine ourselves objectively and come to a conclusion. And we found that about 21 of them what? were not actually qualified by wow. the standards that the NGC set down. Wow. And JRP commenced an action saying, you know what? Declare that these people are not qualified to become judges. You know, I mean, fortunately, the president, in forwarding this list of names of appointees, yeah. excluded 20 of the 21. Only one of those people got appointed. So, for, for, I mean, for us, it, I, I mean, for me personally, it seems like a win to me because, you know. That's impact. Yes, impact. You know, so it's, it's baby steps, but this works. So essentially, the goal is to reform the society project by project. Yeah. Um, before you before you go, um, shortly it's going to be two pronged question. Okay. Um, you know this idea of the common man, mm-hmm. oppressed, powerless. Mm. You know, um, almost an inevitable offender or victim <laughs> yeah. to the um, existing economic mm. imbalance, mm. poverty that automatically makes him an inevitable scapegoat. Mm. Right. It's almost like a paradox in line with the fact that when it comes to white collar offenses, there's almost a psychophantic hmm. laxity to um, the manner in which those cases are taken. A handle. What, yeah, a handle. You know, what, what was your opinion in line with that? In seeming, hmm. linking that to the supposed, I don't know, corruption of the judiciary in line hmm. with the fact that a lot of these things are like, what, what are your opinions? Quick based on what you think okay. can be done in <laughs> so such I a mean <laughs> side because it seems like such a big problem. Yeah, if I yeah. if I if I understand you correctly, you're saying that the poor, the oppressed, the vulnerable are by the society standards pushed to crime. Yeah. Lack of a mental so they are forced to go into crime. And once they go into crime, the system comes down on them and punishes them. Meanwhile, on the other hand, the rich man who commits a bigger crime is left alone. Yeah. Um first of all, it's not a problem of law. Mm. It's a problem of people. Um, leaders don't have the moral courage. They don't have the, I mean, the skin. Most of the time, these white <laughs> collar offenses are mostly by the government. <laughs> don't have the skin. I know some. There's a governor who's caught on camera packing dollars. There's another one who, the an next governor, had two bullion vans. You know, driving mm-hmm. to his house during the elections. And these are prima facie evidence of a money laundering. But nobody's going to act on it. It's the people. I know until. Nigeria as a people, this is outside law completely, yeah. decides that we want things done differently, perhaps by revolution, perhaps by election, perhaps by, you know, some other means of strife and struggle, nothing's going to change. Mm. The laws can be picture perfect, but if the government chooses to disregard the law and the courts as they've done, nothing's going to change. Yeah. You know, and the common man will continue to hope in a judiciary that favors him. Mm. The day the judiciary stops to favor him, he has nobody to run to. Mm. So yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I understand that that, that makes sense because mm-hmm. I mean the the law was made for the people, the people were made for the law and um, mm-hmm. if the, the people determine the people that would be in judiciary mm-hmm. executive exactly. legislation. Um thank you for that. Before yeah. we go, seeing you I mean it's just the concept of breakfast of mile, you're trying to get <laughs> these personalities who seem to be doing a lot of these interesting things in this space. Mm-hmm. You understand? You need to show that practices beyond simply you mm. know probably talking to the person who is like year three and it's like ah, mm. i don't want to do this probably has a music career mm. that, I want to <laughs> pursue, that i might just abandon later and going oh, with what you do now like what advice do you have mm. for i mean because obviously your journey is still just starting you understand yep and it's all so there's <laughs> also it's also important to have perspective from the person who's just starting out as opposed to the person who's who has mm. gone so far so like what well, what do you think uh, tidbit you can give to help them with their journey okay okay yeah. thanks so I, I, I mean i'll just say first of all that um if you have a music career in school now and you, you're confused about doing law i'll tell you that law is good because law is a stepping stone to many things mm. a lawyer who's a musician you know a lawyer who's a comedian a lawyer who's a presenter a book a case in point yeah it's very likely to do well mm. so go for it um if you want to practice law there's a lot of hard work um, it's a lot of humility. It's a lot of learning. You have to keep your head on the ground, you know. Um, I tell people that I'm only proud for the press. If you see me, I'm very humble normally. I ask questions. I say I don't know. Yeah. I wait for people to tell me what to do, you know. And in my early years, I've learned a lot. 
But I mean, ultimately, I've identified three factors I think everybody should have, not just lawyers. Yeah. And um, I will just run over them. The first one is focus. Mm. You, know, you need to know what you want. And when you know what you want, you need to focus on it from start to finish. You need to not take your eyes off the ball. There will be distractions, stay focused. Yeah. The second is determination, mm. resilience. In your chase for whatever you want, you can't stop. Is it not, it's not enough to keep your eyes on it. You must also keep running towards it. It's super important, you know, and there will be obstacles. You will fail, but you just have to get up and keep running. And the final one is to believe. Believe in yourself, you know, and believe in something much greater than you. I tell people, I'm, I'm not afraid to say I'm a Christian. You know, I love God. Yeah. And I depend on him for most things I do. In fact, for all things I do. Um. So these three things in a nutshell for me do it for me. And um, if I will add anything else, um, I would just say that there is no substitute for hard work. Hmm. Even in my experience with you know young lawyers, well, you know recently our generation has this <laughs> new tagline where it goes, "Don't work hard, work smart." Nah, you know I mean even working smart is working hard, right? Because it just means that you know how to manage your effort yeah, and know where to put it. I get it. what that wait, I, I get <laughs> the idea of that statement, but it feels like it feels like it comes from a sense of take shortcuts like i feel like that's what it usually applies nah. towards <laughs> because like work smart is to just yeah. they, they are ways <laughs> you can do it but, Fair I, mean, enough. Round up, yeah. but I mean i mean it's not work smart still work hard you know and this is up to you for hard work you must put your head down and do the work and just to highlight to illustrate this i've been marking a couple essays for the professor jls essay competition mm. and what i did notice is that people just don't apply themselves the question that says evaluate taxation in digital space something of that sort the question has some keywords. You have to look into those questions. You have to answer the question. You have to put yourself into the work. Mm. If you don't do that, I think you're going to do a half big job and get a ceremony thrown on your behalf. It's not going to happen. Yeah. So you have to do the work. You know. So I just want to just say, I mean, this is it for me. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank uh, you very much for coming. It was yeah, and I hope really this helps. Nice to have you. We had conversations that I think are relevant to what's thank going you on very in the industry, and that's what this is about. Thank you very thank much you for coming. Coming.